so, um, uh, so if you'd like to review the slides and uh, the video later on, those will be disseminated uh, to everyone who's here, okay? Uh, through uh, email and the Facebook groups and uh, the video will be on YouTube uh, quite likely. So without further ado, uh, please welcome uh, uh, Prof Chen Muha. Okay, thanks May, for the introduction. And thanks for having me here. Uh, so, okay, one second. Let me get the marker out. Yeah. Okay, so uh, today I'm presenting the talk. Title is Understanding Event Processes in Natural Language. That is actually a part of the technical sessions in the upcoming ACL tutorial we are giving at uh, uh, in this August. And uh, the tutorial title is about advanced central natural language understanding or advanced central natural language processing. Um, so in this part of the talk, we will focus on uh, machine comprehension of event processes. And I'm going to provide a high level introduction to several key challenges in this area, which include how to model and predict the evolution of events and how do we infer the intentions and the consequences of uh, the performer of the event processes and also how should knowledge about event processes help downstream tasks for uh, natural language understanding and also machine perception. Yeah. So the first message I wanna bring in here is that uh, we know human language always communicates about the progress of events. For example, when we talk about earning a PhD degree, there are so many relevant events we can talk about starting from fulfilling the course requirement, passing the qualification exam, so on and so forth until we defend the dissertation or maybe file the dissertation. So in that way, definitely understanding natu uh, natural language by the machine should also involve understanding events. So yeah, here definitely we have this first fundamental question. So what is an event? Right? So there have been actually different definitions by psychologists, linguistics and the computer scientists. And I think debates are still ongoing but there are one uh, definition which is close to consensus, which means that an event is actually an action or a series of action which happen at a specific location within a period of time, and it causes changes to the status of some object or objects. Uh, for example, we have one event uh, description at here, Jeff shaved my hair yesterday at home. So here we have the protagonist or performer, Jeff, which performs the action shape to the object my hair. So in that case, the status of my hair will be changed to maybe becoming shorter, right? And optionally, we may also have uh, time, yesterday and location like at home in an event description. Although the location and the time are sometimes optional. What is actually important is actually the action and also the object that is affected by the action. So this is one uh, description of event. And uh, so far, plenty of work has been done to extract events in text. This is actually not going to be the focus of this talk. And if you go through the tutorial, some uh, other speakers before me will talk about this part. But I will just say there are supervised methods, which is kind of like uh, uh, an ER. So that is to say we have annotated documents like ACE, RED, ER, so on and so forth. And we train a model like uh, um, a CIF model or a sequence structure generator to extract events from documents. Or lots of the cases, people also use unsupervised methods, which uh, depends on semantic role labeling. That is to say, we perform SIL on text so that the SIL can detect uh, verbs as the event trigger, uh, which is the action, and also arguments as the protagonist and also the object, something like that. However, I want to say to understand events in natural language, only by extracting them is not enough. This is because events are often not simple standalone stand predicates. They often form processes. For example, we know that uh, as a part of earning a PhD, uh, we need to first fulfill the course requirements. And after that, we can uh, try to pass a qualification exam, which will further lead to dissertation proposal. So that's actually a part of the process in earning a PhD. Right? And also events are often described in different granularities, which means that for a coarse grain event like publishing a paper, it may include a more fine grain event processes of uh, uh, writing, the, writing the paper, passing the peer review and uh, presenting the paper at the conference. Right? 
And also events, related events are often directed by specific intents or central goals. For example, we know that all the events at here are fulfilling the course requirement, defending the dissertation, so on and so forth. They are directed by the same goal of earning the PhD. Actually, all those properties, they are often not directly extractable from text. Therefore, often will involve some efforts of prediction. So in this part of the talk, will focus on the event process, which is modeled as a set of partially ordered events that are centered around us, uh, the common protagonist. For example, again, for the process of one year PhD, we have, the uh, we have the common protagonist, which is a student, and the student will start from fulfilling the course requirements, so on and so forth, until filing the dissertation. And uh, there are different types of uh, fundamental prediction problems we may uh, expect the machine to perform event process completion, which concerns the prediction about what happens next. And also intention prediction, that is something like, uh, does the machine understand the goal of the process, digging a hole, putting seeds in the hole and fulfilling the hole with soil leads to the central goal of planting a plant. And also we have the problem of membership prediction, that is to infer what are the essential steps of buying a car. And also salience prediction, does the machine understand that defending the dissertation is more important than doing the internship in terms of any PhD? These are some examples of uh, uh, fundamental prediction problems around event processes. And uh, for uh, real world applications, actually, I want to say understanding event processes is actually very important everywhere. For example, when we do narrative prediction, which means that uh, when we have a partially complete story, for example, right here we have the story about a boy visiting his aunt, and uh, but the boy get jealous about his sisters, and he took a bite at his sister uh, when and he just doesn't uh, didn't uh, pay attention. Then so, that's actually a story from the rock story test. And uh, in order to infer that between uh, the two optional ending. Uh, he was scolded or was, uh, should be more meaningful than she gave him a cookie for being so nice. One meaningful solution is to keep track of the evolution of events so that we know that after getting jealous, getting angry and talk about that someone, it's more meaningful to be followed by getting scolded rather than getting a cookie as a reward, right? And similarly in machine com reading comprehension, we also see cases in which understanding, for example, biological processes can be use that to help uh, scientific question answering around biological uh, articles. Uh, I'll, I'll talk about that in more detail later. So uh, for the rest of the talk, I will split it into four uh, technical parts. I will uh, first uh, focus on recent advances for uh, event process completion, and uh, also talk about event intention prediction problem. I will, I will show how event processes can help different NLU uh, downstream and uh, natural language understanding tasks. And uh, I will also spend a little bit of time about uh, some over research directions in this area. And between every part, I will uh, leave some space in case the audience has some questions. So let's first look at the problem of event process completion. So there are actually uh, two different definitions of event process completion. Why is to say that uh, given a partially complete event process, a system is required to predict the missing step and uh, also most of the time, uh, perhaps predicting the continuation of the process, future steps. And another definition, which is more challenging, that is to say, given a cost grain event as an objective, for example, buying a car, uh, sorry, buying a house, the system tries to predict the entire process of the objective from scratch. So these are the two common definitions people are dealing with. Uh, so for the first definition of event process completion, uh, one of the earliest attempts to uh, infer the completion process is uh, done by uh, Chambers and Jorowski in uh, 2008. This is actually a very pioneering work in this area. So in this paper, uh, the principle is that uh, they, uh, they try to uh, conduct the unsupervised event process completion based on corpus statistics. That is to say, given a large corpus, in this work, they actually use the event, uh, 11 years of giga word, and the system captures the co-occurrence of events in the same local context based on their PMI. Right? So that's the metric they're using. 
And then during inference, uh, given a partially complete event process, the next event will be predicted as the one which uh, maximizes the accumulated, uh, accumulated PMI. So the principle is kind of simple. And uh, here uh, we have one example of prediction given by their system. So that is to say, let's say given a process starting from completed, admits, and the convicted, uh, it is likely that the follow-up should be sentenced, paroled, of, or fired, and so on and so forth. And actually in the same work, it also is also showed that uh, the event process completion in this way was able to lead to as much as 36% of improvement on the New York Times narrative close test over the best baseline during that time. Although that's kind of outdated from, from nowadays perspective, but seems like uh, uh, in early days when people start to deal with event process completion, this is actually helping a lot in narrative reach. So there are several significant works that follow Chambers and the Jurovsky's design. One of them is by uh, Kira Radinsky and Horvitz, uh, which was published in 2013. So in this work, they extend the unsupervised learning of event processes to a cross-document scenario. That is to say, uh, let's say given six months span of New York Times articles, news articles. The system first identified topically cohesive documents along a specific period of time. Then from the titles of those related documents, uh, they apply a maximum entropy based model to capture the co-occurrence of events in a chain. That is actually similar to the effect of the PMI based model. So anyway, the, this is a kind of uh, also metric learning which captures the co-occurrence of events. Then later the technology is applied to predict possible force coming use along the timeline which is generated from the corpus, such that the system can predict, for example, the likelihood of cholera rising should be high after a drought followed by storms in Angola. Right? So a typical application of this technology is to do timeline generation and a news bridge. Um, anyone has questions, just in case. Does anyone have questions? Uh, we realize we, we want to get the entire seminar done within an hour, but uh, if you have quick questions, uh, I invite you to unmute and, and make yourself known. Yeah. yeah, actually, I can, I, can, I can continue because so there is this, I can, I can ask for uh, questions before the event process completion part is finished. Yeah. Okay, yeah. So, yeah, so the aforementioned line of research focuses on predicting forthcoming events after a part of the seeing event process. Then a more challenging research question would be, can we induce a new process for a specific goal without seeing a part of it? Say, uh, given the objective of buying a house, can we let the machine automatically induce all of its steps without knowing a part of it beforehand? This is actually a hard problem that is recently tackled by our EMLP paper last year. And the general idea is very straightforward. So basically we try to uh, leverage the analogous property of events and transfer the knowledge uh, from processes we already know to new processes we don't know. Actually, this, is, uh, this mimics how human understand event processes uh, for objectives that we are not familiar with. For example, assume that one has never bought a house. Therefore, one may not know how, what's the detailed process of it. But assumably one may already know, have some ideas at least about other relevant processes of, for example, how to buy a car or how to rent a house. Then intuitively, those relevant processes should contain some relevant steps. And based on such relevant steps, we may guess the necessary steps of buying a house, even though we don't have the real example, a real experience. So this is the overall framework of this system. I, I, I try to uh, just give some high level introduction. So we operate the system into three, uh, into three steps. So the first step, given the goal, let's say uh, buying a house, the system will try to find a group of uh, reference processes that either share the same uh, action or share, share the same object, which means that we'll get lots of buying something or lots of some action that is taken upon the house. 
and then we will get a lot of those uh, processes as, ref as reference processes. And after that, from those reference processes, we will do a step of conceptualization. That is to say, for every event at here, we will do some abstraction of, for example, uh, try to convert all the actions, all the verbs, and also all the nouns to their hypernames. Right. Then after we gather abstracted representations of all the relevant processes, we will try to merge them and find a common pattern. And from the common pattern, we will do uh, instantiation, which uh, gets the uh, relevant verbs, uh, more fine-grained meanings of verbs and also nouns from the abstract patterns to generate a process which describes how to buy a house. Yeah. This is a kind of uh, high level. I don't want to go to too much detail, but here there could be some results which might be interesting. For example, uh, we actually created a data set for this task from the website called WikiHow, which is a website basically tells, uh, tells you about how to perform something, for example, how to hear, see a stake or how to, uh, let's say, uh, find a, uh, how to see a stake or how to make a cake step by step. We created a data set from there. And uh, here, uh, some key experiments show that uh, the system we produced actually performs uh, much better than uh, some, for example, sequence to sequence generation models. Although we are still having uh, a large gap of the state of our art performance uh, in comparison to human performance. We are currently reaching about half of the human performance so far. As I said, this is a kind of challenging task. But at the same time, on the right hand side, we can show this kind of meaningful uh, example. Let's say given the objective of treating the pain, the system can actually predict uh, identifying symptoms, seeing doctor, recognizing symptom, and also taking supplement, which is kind of meaningful. So we do have the data set and the system released in the website has, I'll, I'll, I'll share the slides with uh, me. So anyone who's interested are welcome to take a look at the resources we have, yeah. Okay, so any questions about event process completion before I go to event intention prediction? So if you have a question, please raise your hand. I think our speaker can pause for about 30 seconds before he can move on. Um, I saw Mohammed unmuted. Do you want to ask something or? Reza, do you want to? Uh, okay, so he's uh, okay. on to mute. Yeah. Uh, or you and uh, Jen Lai, do you have any questions for our speaker? So Kat asked in the chat, uh, is the evaluations done by human uh, subjects? Uh, actually, not really. Uh, actually, we treated this as a generation generative task. So we did some metrics, for example, uh, Roche, and uh, yeah. Actually, we we didn't do human evaluation because we already have like an existing uh, data set. Yeah, and the evaluation so far is still kind of intrinsic. Yeah, but. The, the problem is kind of challenging. So, so we are still trying to ex extend the work because we are still having about half of the gap from, from human performance. Yeah. Oh, actually the human performance is definitely uh, evaluated from a uh, human subject. Yeah. Oh, actually I mean, so by the way, I, I cannot see uh, the, the chat. So while okay. I'm sharing the screen. So ah, all just right. in case, let me make yeah. sure I can uh, okay. do that. Yeah, I think the settings are incorrect. Yeah, please go ahead. Yeah, okay, no yes, yeah, questions. Sure. Okay, so let's look at look at the event intention prediction problem. So the motivation of this prediction problem is that people can easily anticipate the intents and possible reactions of participants in an event. <clears throat> For example, suppose we have this event, person X cooks Thanksgiving dinner. Uh, we may easily guess that uh, the intent of the person X could be maybe uh, he or she wants to impress their family. And uh, the reaction could be person X gets tired, but 
still gets a sense of belonging. And uh, at the same time, the reaction of the family will be they are impressed, right? So for this, uh, similar to human behavior, we will also expect that if we develop the, a system which is eventually common sense aware, the, the system should also perform this kind of inference, definitely, right? So the, this problem is first attempted in this work, which is called Event in Mind, that is published by uh, UW people in three, year, three years ago in the ACL. So this event in mind system is developed based on a large cross-source corpus, which contains around uh, 2000 and, uh, 25,000 events and also free form descriptions of their intents and reactions, all generated by uh, the crowd also. And the model is trained on the corpus to perform a sequence to engram generation, which shows kind of generalization to give uh, free form intention prediction of events. For example, let's say given the events, uh, the person X cooks steak, the system is able to infer that the, uh, the possible intent could be to kill their hunger, to make uh, dinner for their family, so on and so forth, and uh, similar things to reactions and uh, other people's reaction. Right? So yeah, this is the work, which is also, I would say the principle is not very complicated, but one uh, noteworthy message we my get is that this is actually the work which inspired several follow-up works which that are quite uh, famous in the area of common sense inference, for example, Atomic and Comet, if you know about those. Atomic is actually uh, one extended resource based on event in mind, which is about lots of uh, triplets for uh, common sense inference. And the, the Comet is actually a knowledge uh, is actually a knowledge aware language model, which was trained based on the atomic corpus. Yeah, both are developed by, uh, I think, Ye Jing Choi from AI2 and Yuda. Yeah. So naturally, uh, we can say that the intention prediction problem also previously was tackled on single events. That could also apply to event process as well. That is actually suggested by cognitive studies which tells us that a process of events is always defined by the central goal or the intent of the, of the performer. For example, when we see the process of uh, digging a hole, for seizing the hole, then for filling the hole with soil and water the soil, we human can easily tell that this should be the process which leads to the central goal, planting a plant or growing a garden or similar something, right? And also when we see the process of making a dough, add toppings and preheat the oven and bake the dough, we know that that's something which leads to cooking a pizza or baking a focaccia so on and so forth, right? So uh, actually uh, we know that humans can always understand the event process by hypothesizing what should be the objective the process aims for or what should be the ultimate consequence the process uh, seeks to accomplish, right? So to mimic this kind of understanding in this 2020 Kono paper published last year by, by us, we proposed a new cognitively motivated semantic typing task for event processes, uh, which seeks to infer what should be the overall action the process seeks to take and what type of objects the process should affect. And to facilitate the research on this problem, again, we contributed with a large data set of typed event processes from WikiHow. And uh, as well as we also propose an effective method to address the problem based on indirect supervision. Yeah, so the data set we generate uh, has more than 60,000 event processes and each come with a free form label of the overall action and also the label of the overall object type. And uh, Actually, this typing system is kind of challenging because you know we are dealing with a super fine-grained typing system. We are having more than 1,000 action type labels and more than 10,000 object type labels and all in free form. And actually lots of those labels are free shortcases, cases such that more than 85% of labels appear less than 10 times. And among those labels, nearly a half of them just appear once. And also we do have lots of external, external label cases, which means that uh, in around 90% 90, 90 of the processes, 
we see that the action label and also the object label do not even appear in the process body, which means that if we want to uh, apply an attractive method, ex extractive method, it will easily fall short. So how do we solve this non-trivial typing problem, which is ultra fine grain and has lots of few shot, zero shot, few shot, one shot cases? We propose a practical form of indirect supervision based on gloss knowledge. So the gloss knowledge is just, uh, for example, when you go to WordNet, you see a word sense definitions of verbs and, and nouns. We term them as a kind of gloss knowledge. And by using gloss knowledge as indirect supervision, that is, that is to say, given an event process, instead of just uh, uh, try to infer the label itself, we try to let the model infer the correct WordNet definition for the type labels. So this becomes something that is similar to you have an NLI, uh, NLI model, which takes the process as a, a hypothesis, uh, sorry, as a premise, and then infer the gloss definition as a, as a premise. Uh, sorry, as a hypothesis. So the, yeah, sorry, the process is a, is a premise and, uh, and the gloss definition is a hypothesis. So the reason we, pref uh, we perform this kind of uh, gloss-based uh, inference is that uh, we know the gloss themselves are much more semantically richer than the labels themselves. And also the gloss information is kind of uh, useful side information, which jumpstarts those labels that are really seen or unseen in training, because we have lots of few short and zero short cases. So yeah, this is the overall architecture we are having. So again, I said this is kind of similar to training and uh, natural language inference model. So we use one robot language model, which encodes the event process sequence. And at the same time, we use the same language model to encode the definition for the label. And uh, jointly, we concat them together and perform the learning to rank. So the ranking is performed, of course, uh, based on all the glosses of the label space. And also, uh, for some cases in which the type label, like uh, for example, make or bank, for those labels, you may have different meanings. We also incorporate a word sense desegregation model to try to select the correct uh, definition for those polysemous labels. And uh, so the results shows that this kind of uh, gloss knowledge based uh, indirect supervision is kind of uh, helpful in this case, we're actually getting more than uh, 2.88 folds of improvement in terms of mean reciprocal rank by just uh, incorporating the gloss knowledge itself. And at the same time, because we are jointly uh, training for typing both the action and the work project, we also see that this kind of multitask learning also provides some kind of uh, uh, complementary supervision signal that further improves the uh, performance Although at the same time, we do see that word sense disintegration leads to much lesser improvement. This could be the case that uh, predominant senses are representative enough to uh, represent the labels themselves, which is kind of consistent to what people typically observe in the WSD task. And here we have this case study, which shows how the system uh, perform process typing on the news domain. For example, uh, given a process of, let's say, making explosive materials, obtaining container, obtaining shrapnel, and also in installing a trigger, the system, can, the system can infer that this is uh, relevant to, for example, assembling a grenade or assembling a blaster. Although we know that in WikiHow, the web session not tell you how to build a bomb or build a grenade, but there's some kind of generalizes to those cases, yeah. And uh, we in this table, I also label those uh, labels which appear less than 10 times, those future labels uh, as blue, which tells us that actually by incorporating this kind of gloss knowledge, this helped the system give more uh, fair, uh, actually less biased prediction so that you don't produce make and get those kind of frequent verbs all the time. And uh, also we have a simple web demo I can actually show right now. 
Uh, yeah, can you see the web page? I just drag that here. Yeah, okay, thanks. Yeah, so this is the demo actually posted on Dan Ross group as a, as a UPEN. So his group is called Cognitive Computation Group. So here we can see that, for example, using some existing uh, example, starting from reading papers, attending conferences, go to seminars, and write a thesis. Uh, I pray. Yeah, so the system predicts that the objective is something which is close to getting a doctor, doctorate. Also, maybe it's, it, it's also related to get, getting a master's degree. Yeah. Also, we can use, for example, digging a hole for seizing the hole for fill the soil and water the soil. That leads to, for example, growing a garden. And we can type uh, the as an example we just had in the slides. Uh, so make a doll add toppings, for example, preheat the oven, make the dough. This is something which is called to, for example, baking focaccia, baking Italian bread, for example, something like that. Yeah. And this demo can be found in a paper at here. So in this paper, if you go to the paper, which is titled, what are we trying to do? Semantic typing of event processes. And uh, on the first page, there's actually a link which points to the demo and also the data set we, uh, we collected. Okay, so let me perhaps go back to the presentation. Yeah, actually, that's the very end of inten event intention prediction. So, does anyone has question? Please feel free to unmute and ask. So, if you have questions, uh, feel free to raise your hand or unmute, or if you're daring, uh, show your face. Uh, hi, hi, Professor. Uh, thanks for the interesting uh, talk. And I want to ask a question for event prediction. I, I also know another topic uh, called a uh, inverse uh, reinforcement learning, and uh, it is also infer, inferring the intention uh, from a series of uh, behavior sequence. So uh, how do you see the difference? Uh, is it uh, some uh, longer sequence will be more useful, uh, more useful in the inverse reinforcement learning setting? Uh, that's actually a great question. Um, okay, so first of all, personally, I, I am not very exactly familiar with uh, inverse reinforcement learning, but what I know is that, uh, okay, for example, one relevant topic that is currently undergoing in my colleague Jonathan May's group is that he's working on uh, the problem called a uh, text game or textual game, which is something like you, uh, for example, read a textbook and uh, after uh, reading a section, you will be provided uh, with several optional actions and the action actually affects what, what, what will be the ongoing, what will be the continuation of the story. So over there, actually, uh, the methods about uh, reinforcement learning, of course, but we are actually recently thinking about incorporating the knowledge of event processes into that, into that task because of course, event processes prof, uh, provide you some kind of uh, knowledge about uh, consistency of how things should happen cont uh, continuously. And that if we incorporate that kind of uh, knowledge into the reward function of uh, reinforcement learning, all hypothesis that it, maybe this could help, for example, textual game, yeah, something like that, yeah. But the general idea is, yeah, I agree, uh, event processes can help uh, you provide uh, the supervision of uh, consistency in narrative prediction and also uh, maybe dialogue systems. Yeah, there are lots of open spaces at here. Maybe some of them are, are in the inter intersection between uh, 
narration and also uh, your enforcement learning. Yeah, thanks. That's a great question. Yeah. Anything else before I move on to the downstream tasks? Yeah, let's. Yeah, I think we can go ahead. Thank you. Yeah, okay, thanks. Okay, so next I'll just briefly talk about three, three or four uh, downstream tasks. And this one uh, we already covered at the beginning. So we know that uh, event process model the plausible evaluation progress of events in a context. So definitely that could be used to improve the consistency of narrative prediction or maybe uh, story close. Yeah. So using this idea, uh, the work pro uh, published by Snigda Chattavaji, who is now a system professor in UNC uh, in 2017, they actually use three types of uh, sequential features. Uh, they use the event sequences in 20 years of the New York Times. And also at the same time, they use the uh, sentiment trajectory and also topical consistency. But actually, among those three types of features, Snake actually point out that uh, the event sequence is actually the most uh, uh, impactful feature, such that using this feature alone, you will get lots of, uh, you will get very uh, promising performance on Rock Story already. Yeah. And also, at the same time, uh, there are works pointing out that modeling event process is also important for machine reading comprehension. So in this task, the system tries to uh, answer some questions that are related to a given article. So one uh, work I like about is the best paper award in uh, EMLP 2014, which was published by, I think, Vivek um, uh, Kumar, who was a postdoc at Stanford, but now he's probably associate professor already in University of Utah. So in this work, uh, they try to perform uh, question answering about biological articles. So to solve this problem, uh, they actually first extract biological processes, events and their relations, biological events and their relations from the documents. And then the question answering is conducted as matching the events in the question with the extracted uh, process structure from the document. And uh, definitely they show that understanding this kind of event process, biological event process is helping a lot. Yeah. That's kind of, uh, Meaningful, yeah. And another key application is uh, video segmentation. So this task aims to understand the content of a video, then splitting it into different relatively independent segments. For example, when we have a video talking about perhaps uh, making a pancake, this can be split into segments about uh, the background and also different steps of the cooking. Yeah. So in the recent works by Jukov and also Daniel Fried in different papers. Uh, this problem is done by first extracting the narration in a video, then aligning the narration to different steps in a WikiHow event process. So in this way, different steps of an event process naturally serve as anchors for different video segments. Yeah, again, I have to say WikiHow seems to be a useful resource uh, in probably last year, a lot of papers in NLP area and also computer vision suddenly start to use that uh, resource to solve lots of problems. Others include, for example, summarization, knowledge extraction and so forth, in addition to event process understanding. Yeah. Also in the same area, uh, there are also works focusing on directly recognizing and modeling event processes in videos, for example, there's one work which is coming up in this year, CVPR, that is by our collaborators in Columbia University. Uh, so in this work, they propose to use hyperbolic embeddings to capture the uh, event evolution processes in videos. So here, uh, because the same kind of event process may branch into different possible paths, naturally that forms hierarchies, which are suitable to be captured by the hyperbolic ge geometry. So I, I like this work a lot because I also work on hyperbolic geometry and I think the integration is actually quite meaningful right here. And this is actually a very new work which, is, uh, which has just been announced in uh, the archive two months ago, but I know this work has just been uh, accepted to CVPR. Yeah. 
Okay, so these are some examples of applications which can be uh, built upon understanding event processes. So any questions before I move on to open research directions? Are there any other questions for our speaker, for Muha? I think everyone's interested in open research directions so they can scope out their next paper, perhaps collaborating with you. So <laughs> maybe you can go ahead. Okay, yeah, yeah, let's go ahead, yeah. Okay, yeah, there are several interesting problems. Uh, some of them we has just have just started to work on and uh, some of them I think it will happen uh, at any time. Uh, we haven't personally done them yet. So one problem, which is actually a direct follow-up of the event, in event process intention prediction. That's actually something we just started recently. That's the problem which we call salience or essentiality detection event processes. So that means, uh, okay, so previously we already introduced that uh, when given an event process, we can try to infer the, the central goal of the event process. But at the same time, we notice that uh, for the central goal, different steps are actually not equally important. For example, still we consider the process of planting a plant. If we only uh, preserve the first three steps, digging a hole, putting seeds in, fulfilling the hole with soil, while we remove the water to the soil, we can still tell that this is a process of planting a plant, right? However, if we remove the second step, we just see digging a hole, fulfilling the hole with soil and the water the soil without seeing the putting, uh, putting the seeds in the hole. It's really hard to tell whether we are trying to plant in something or try to grow in or something, or you know, it's not even possible for us to tell what we are brewing, right? And at the same time, if we consider earning a PhD, we know that uh, defending the dissertation is essential. Doing a TA ship is probably less important. It's not required everywhere. And I, I think it's not required in some UK schools. And at the same time, during the internship is most of the time optional, right? So the fundamental question will be, how do we automatically in, in identify the salient events or essential events in a process? And at the same time, how do we use this kind of essentiality understanding to help downstream tasks such as objective summarization so when we do summarization, definitely we want to preserve what are important and uh, maybe discuss something which are too unimportant, right? So this is actually a problem. We, we are just at the stage of uh, producing, producing the learning resource recently, but probably this work should be submitted in AAAI if it works in the right timeline, yeah. Another interesting problem is about uh, temporal common sense understanding of events. So uh, actually there are three different kinds of temporal common sense understanding. So that concerns do language models understand time duration, typical time and the typical frequency. So time duration means we can ask the language model, uh, does it understand that any of PhD takes several years but not several months and not lifelong time hopefully, right? And also having a banquet dinner that should take around an hour or two hours, but not several minutes or not the entire day, right? And the typical time is about, does the language model understand that uh, people eat breakfast in the morning, not at noon or uh, another time of the day. And tornadoes often strike Florida typically in the middle of the year or not at the beginning or at the end of the year, right? And typical time frequency means, does the machine understand uh, cars change oil every year or every half year, depending on whether you have a luxury car or not. Right? But you should not do this every month or even for shorter time or for a longer time span. Right? And uh, people pay utility, utility bills every month, or every two months. Right? So to uh, tackle all those different aspects of temporal common sense understanding as a whole, in this EMLP 2019 paper, Bandro et al, they released this data set, which is called going on vacation takes longer than going for a walk. Actually the data set is called MC taco. Right? Multiple choice, uh, I don't know what taco stands, maybe temporal common sense. Yeah. 
And uh, after that, they released uh, one follow up, which is about using distance supervision to improve the performance of language model on this problem. But so far, there's just uh, this single follow up. So I do think there are lots of possibility uh, for this problem, which is kind of very interesting. Yeah. And uh, also, there's this problem which is called event ordering. So this problem is promising because there are uh, test beds released, but uh, there's so far not an effective solution yet. So this problem uh, is meaningful because consider that when we describe different events in a document, it's not necessarily that the nar narrative order is consistent with the temporal order. Right, we can use the reverse order anytime. So how to understand the correct temporal order of events in different documents? So there are actually two test beds for this problem. One is published by Ning Chang, who's, who was a researcher in AI3, but now he recently joined Amazon. That's the paper in last year's EMLP. The title is called Talk. So this is actually a machine comprehension question answering data set, which includes 3.2 new snippets and also more than uh, 20,000 questions. Yeah. And also at the same time, there's a data set released by Chris Kalisenberg from their group from UPenn. This data set is called, uh, uh, it's also based on WikiHow. Yeah. But also at the same time last year. And in the same context, uh, I want, also want to say another meaningful problem pro probably could be, uh, let's say given a set of events, suppose we can understand the meaningful order for them, then can we use the induced order to help with uh, constrained natural language generation or story generation? Right? That's actually another meaningful problem. I don't think lots of people have focused on. I think uh, Nan Yun Peng, who was at USC but recently joined UCLA, they had a paper in this year's AAAI, which is kind of similar, although they only focused on keywords, sequences of keywords, not events. But this is actually uh, also a potentially promising problem. Yeah. Uh, for a uh, uh, skip event extraction. So there are also more tasks could benefit from understanding event processes. So one is that we have shown uh, that uh, using event processes that can help the consistency in narrative prediction. Then to go one step further, can we use this kind of knowledge about event processes to improve the consistency of maybe utterance generation or utterance retrieval for chatbots? Right? This is actually also a meaningful problem. And at the same time, I have to say it is important to develop reliable learning systems, which helps with understanding clinical event processes, such that the machine can help the clinicians uh, with expensive tasks, such as uh, diagnostic prediction, high-risk disease prediction, or uh, disease phenotype recognition. There's actually some re relevant to some collaboration I'm having with UCLA Medical School. And uh, in this direction, I want to point out that uh, transfer learning and also structure prediction are particularly important because naturally we are suffering from lack of data due to privacy issues. And uh, also there are dependencies among different phenotypes and also disease labels. So structure prediction is always important. Yeah. And uh, at the same time, I want to advertise about our, our tutorial. So this is a tutorial we're having at ACL. The title is called Event Central Natural Language Processing. We have seven speakers and we'll talk about six parts. So uh, Mali and Han from UIUC, they will talk about event extraction, which I mentioned a little bit from the beginning. And uh, Chang from Amazon will talk about event relation, event event relation extraction. And uh, you heard about event process understanding already. And the uh, homing from Yukon, who is the author of the Acer knowledge base, will talk about eventuality knowledge acquisition. And uh, Kathleen McCall will talk about event summarization and natural language generation. And then we'll talk about what should be the future, maybe near future, of uh, event centric natural language processing. Also, some references to this, I should skip them. And thank you for your attention, and I'm happy to take questions.
So thanks, uh, Muha, for giving the very nice talk. We had a couple questions come up, um, uh, and, and I understand you're not able to see uh, the the chat while you're screen sharing. So uh, I'll ask them uh, in tandem to to uh, unmute and uh, um, ask the question. So we have Abana first, and and then Yushi, and then if you want to ask an additional question, go ahead and uh, ask it in the chat, and then I'll, I will call on you to unmute. So Abhinav, you may want to start. Uh, OK, uh, my question was, um, do you have any results on how many events in an event process do you need to predict an intention? Uh, because there are some four events in an event process, and then you get an intention. But maybe even if you remove one of them, you still might get the same prediction. Is there, any, is there any intuition on how many event processes are particularly required for predicting an intention pretty confident? Okay, okay, thanks for the question. I think I think probably I can separate your questions into two parts. So I think one is about how many event processes I have to say, you know, it's hard to tell. So while you train a summarization model, how many data you, you need, right? I would say the more the better. The more data provides you a more generalizable system, of course. Uh, and uh, I think the other question you kind of uh, mentioned is what if we remove some steps from the event process, can we still infer the central goal? I think that's regarding the soundness of uh, intention prediction, which is definitely relevant to the problem of uh, essentiality detection. That's something we are currently working on. We want to identify that given a process, what are the steps we cannot remove? Or, which means that if we remove those steps or some of those steps, we are not able to infer the central goal. That's actually the problem we haven't solved yet, but we are working on a learning resource and try to work on this. And I would imagine there are lots of uh, possible follow-ups for this, a challenging problem. You can think about after we got the resource and we got several baselines, then people can probably imagine, can we do some kind of adversarial attack to improve the robustness or soundness of the system? Something like that. Yeah, thanks for the great questions. Okay, we have another question from Yushi. Um, okay, thanks, Prof. I also have a question about salience detection. So um, I'm wondering that does the model have consistent results um, about the event importance um, um, with humans? Because um, I think that um, usually the model have different decisions um, compared with that humans. So do you have any interesting findings about this? Okay, that's a good question. Um, okay, first of all, uh, okay, let me let me first clarify. So as here, I, I mentioned at the same time, salience and essentiality. Uh, they are actually different. So previously, I didn't tell, uh, I didn't talk about why, 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 what, what's the difference? So I had to say essentiality is the steps, refers to the steps which are physically or also they important, which means that uh, you remove this step, the entire process will, will not physically or causally continue. And uh, essential uh, salience means when you describe a process, some steps are important, such that if I omit some of those in the description, the other people will not understand the, the process. One example could be, let's say, uh, uh, for example, uh, in terms of any PhD degree, uh, getting admitted to the PhD program, that's essential. You have to first uh, fulfill these requirements and you can continue, right? But even I don't tell you that I first got admitted into a PhD program, I, I, I start by telling you, okay, I'm taking courses, then passing the PhD qualification exam, you will understand that I'm still in the process of a new PhD, right? I assume, assumably, you know, even I don't tell you that uh, I, I got admitted, you will you, you understand I, I, I must have been a 
automation at the beginning. So that means that uh, the automation is actually essential, but it's not salient. Then let's go to the consistency of prediction. I have to say most of the time, essentiality that's not contextualized, which means that uh, it's more like uh, when I tell you, okay, I'm earning a PhD in different contexts, the process will be about the same. Versus salience is something which is more contextualized, which means that in different documents, when you describe different events happening together in different documents, they will have different importance. So for essentiality prediction, we do expect the model to uh, give quite consistent prediction. That's actually what we keep an eye on when we let a, a crowd to annotate the data. We always try to select a part of the annotations which has high internet annotator agreement. But salience annotation that's on specific documents, that's actually a different problem. That's kind of subjective. The annotation agreement is always low, but that's important is because as I said, that's something which can teach a downstream model for summarization. All right, I think those are really good points. We know that uh, summarization is a, a subjective thing, uh, even despite the, the arguments to uh, grade things using things like Rouge. Um, we had another question. Uh, thanks, Yushi, for your question from Taha. So Taha, can I invite you to take the mic and uh, perhaps provide your video feed when you're asking? Yeah. Uh, so uh, I was curious if, you, uh, if you're thinking about uh, expanding this uh, intention detection thing to uh, to a task with more labels because so uh, so for example you gave the uh, example of buying a house right but mm -hmm. this task actually is different in different countries right so for example if you're in Singapore you need an age limit uh, and then you need to have a family to buy a house and then so let's say if you uh, another example might be giving a time period, right? If you are if you are cooking a pizza in thirty minutes and uh, in two hours, the processes would probably change. So you think about expanding it to, uh, I would say, a task that contains more labels, or uh, yeah, what do you think about it? Oh yeah, that 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 that's a great question. I, I can I think I can also answer them from different perspectives. So the first one is that uh, you pointed out that different processes may be for the same goal may be done in different ways, in different cultures. That's actually one, one problem which a recent DAPA program is okay. at. The problem, the problem is for CCU. So they actually try to uh, uh, you know, look for solutions which can automatically identify the cultural difference of uh, event processes and also other, other kind of concepts. Yeah, so I have to say that is very important, and uh, we are actually proposing some part of that uh, in in that in that proposal we just submitted. So definitely, yeah, we are considering that. We're considering that. So even even the context is not cultural uh, specific. You can imagine that when you suppose, let's say, uh, reserve a make a reservation for a restaurant, you can do it in different ways, right? You can do it on, on, on your phone or you can do it online. So yeah, definitely I think one meaningful extension could be what if we incorporate more contextual information? Yeah, that's definitely very meaningful. And uh, also at the same time, I think you asked about uh, how many labels. I'm not sure if you are referring to the label space, but that's actually one, question I think it, uh, which is very meaningful. So right now we are dealing with a uh, fixed space of uh, typing system in this intention prediction problem. Although we are already having a very large uh, type of vocabularies. So one way to extend it into open domain is we can just basically use all the gloss in, in, of, of words in, in, in the word that. And this is kind of close to open domain, I guess. Yeah, okay. Uh, thank you, thanks. Yi Song has a question. So uh, maybe this is the last question that we'll be able to take for this seminar. 
Yeah, great. Thanks, Prof. Ming. And hi, uh, Prof. Mo Hao. Uh, thanks very much for your talk. Uh, my question is rather a general. Uh, is that um, do you have uh, you guys in the uh, event processing community? Uh, do you have a very standard uh, way to say that a model really understands the event processing? Is it possible that the, the model is just exploiting some surface clue in the data set to reach high accuracy? Um, very similar concern has been, you know, raised by guys in the lexical semantic community because they mm -hmm. found that some supervised hypernaming detection models, they're actually not learning the hypernaming relations. They are just learning that some words tend to be a hypername, then just, it's just directly bringing this says hypername, meaning that they are not learning the relation. They are just learning the one word, uh, one word mm -hmm. as the hypername. So, I mean, um, how do you guys in, in your community uh, uh, are, are, are looking at this problem and do you have a standard way to say a model really understand event processing? Yeah. Okay, thanks. And that's actually a kind of difficult question. So first of all, I have to say, event-centric natural processing, that's actually, uh, I would say, an emerging or rising area, which uh, not lots of people have paid attention from the past, but recently we do see a surge, but we are still in a stage of, uh, you know, you can think about in comparison to event-centric NLP. In, uh, when we deal with it, uh, sorry, sorry, I mean, entity-centric NLP in comparison to entity-centric NLP. When we deal with the events, we are still in a, in, in a stage of, we are short uh, of uh, uh, test beds, uh, benchmarks, and also learning resources. So people are still trying to create different, different uh, learning resources. Even DARPA try to foster those research. Recently, lots of large programs, for example, Kairos and Better, Yelper Better, so on and so forth, uh, AIDA, everything. Lots of, lots of budgets are uh, uh, invested into event process understanding, but there are still a long way to go. Uh, it's really hard to tell whether some uh, understanding behavior or generation behavior by any model is really generalizable or not. That's the case for any task, any NLP task. Uh, but what we, uh, but what I can emphasize on this that uh, while there's no way to prove a system, a learning system we produce is really generalizable or not, we should tackle, we, we should focus on those problems which use, for example, minimal supervision. Uh, minimal supervision means, uh, for example, I can, I can probably refer to this temporal common sense understanding, maybe this paper. So temporal common sense acquisition with minimal supervision. So in this paper, they are going towards this solution of you first uh, engineer some uh, linguistic patterns, which will give you ideally unlimited amount of uh, uh, sentences, which are likely to describe this, uh, this uh, different aspects of temporal, temporal uh, common sense. For example, thinking about if we want to teach the model understand time duration, you can focus on words like uh, dur during or within, and uh, after the word, you see you really see uh, some some you know clause about time duration. So when you have those kind of linguistic patterns, and uh, you can just mine as many as possibly noisy corpus. Uh, as you want, and uh, as long as you have lots of web corpora, then using this kind of method, I would say there are a lot, there are enough evidence to tell people, okay, because I can just get as many training corpora as I want. Eventually, this will lead to a generalizable uh, learning system. Right? This is kind of also an idea which is similar to um, the never-ending learning. Now, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so we've had uh, a good 15 minutes of questions and uh, I'm mindful of the time. So uh, we're going to end our seminar here.
Uh, so let's all thank uh, uh, Prof Chen for giving our seminar in a, a, a nice timing for us, not such a nice timing for him uh, visiting us uh, from the U.S. No, it's, no it's, it's, it's great. Actually, the song set just happened. <laughs> but, <laughs> so yeah, perhaps after we'll the blood moon coming out soon, because I, I think there are lots of people mm -hmm. interested about that as well. Um, so I'll just do uh, one bit of advertising uh, again. Uh, we this uh, NLP seminar that uh, my subgroup is 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 running uh, runs throughout the summer uh, next week uh, on the first of June at uh, nine p.m. Uh, Singapore time, so nine a.m. Uh, in uh, EST. Uh, we'll have Di Yang, uh, assistant professor at uh, Georgia Institute of Technology, giving a talk on natural language processing with less data and more structures. So uh, if you'd like to join us, again, you can just come to this particular Zoom room um, and uh, you can let people know about it. Uh, if they would like an invite as an external guest, uh, please ask them to drop me an email so that we can guarantee there's a sufficient space for the seminar. Okay, with that, I'm going to end the recording and uh, I'll let all of our external guests go. So uh, again, let's thank Muhao uh, for uh, giving the seminar. Thanks. Yeah. So Muhao and uh, 